Fridays. The first meeting is January 20th, 1993. The participants are non-traditional power brokers. Abu Allah is a Palestinian businessman, while Hassan Asfour represents the PLO's communist wing. The Israelis are a pair of young professors, Ron Pundak and Yar Hirschfeld. Expectations are so low, Rabin isn't even told about the meeting. This was, from our point of view, a fact-finding mission. From our point of view, the idea was to see whether the PLO at all is a partner. They convene at a 19th century estate just outside Oslo. The tranquil setting helps smooth nerves during introductions. The group is escorted to a small room to begin its discussions. Almost immediately, there is a feeling of optimism. It was just a nice room, like a guest room. Two tables, one was square and one was round. Instinctively, we went to the round table. I think it, it said a lot. I mean, no hierarchy, no one side against the other side. In that first meeting, the group makes perhaps its biggest breakthrough. They decide not to argue over a final peace plan, but to agree on the steps needed for an eventual accord. Called the Declaration of Principles, it is, in essence, an agreement on how to reach an agreement. After the first initial meeting, which was the only fact-finding mission, my uh, feeling was that uh, we have something in our hand which, if we will play it right, will translate it into something which might, might create a change in the Middle East. The parties return home to report on their progress. Israel's deputy foreign minister, Yossi Belin, decides the Oslo Channel shows enough promise to tell Rabin. Once we came to him with the idea of Oslo, he grabbed it, but he was very, very suspicious about it. More sessions follow in Norway. The Norwegians are pleased by the progress, but fear the talks could be derailed if word leaks out. To ensure secrecy, they frequently switch meeting locations. Finally, after eight months of secret negotiations, an agreement is reached. A final draft of the Declaration of Principles outlines a schedule for the gradual handover of the occupied territories. The easy steps will be tackled first during a five-year interim period. In that time, Israel will withdraw from part of the occupied territories. Palestinians will establish an authority to govern their eventual state and their own police force, the only Palestinians allowed to have weapons. The tougher issues, such as borders, security, refugees, and Jerusalem, will not be negotiated until 1998 under a final status agreement. All of that was postponed. We only focus on how the two sides can live together for a five-year interim period. On August 20th, Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres flies to Oslo for a secret ceremony to sign the declaration. The ceremony is filmed by Norwegian secret police. This is the first time it has been broadcast outside Europe. The ceremony is attended by the main negotiators. The documents are signed and followed not by a reluctant handshake, but with a warm embrace. The biggest achievement was the fact that this piece of land will be divided between the two people. For the document itself, I still proud if I was part of this. Uh, uh, Palestinian side. But no one at the ceremony knows what lies ahead. The trouble that not only threatens the official White House signing, but will derail the entire Oslo Accord.